This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to African News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on African News Tonight... What is happening? We are under attack constantly, as I told you. And we have families that are running away from these attacks that need support. That's Lawrence Kanyuka, spokesman for the M23 rebels in the eastern DRC on a ceasefire deal. Details coming up. Also, an ex-president's son is among those sentenced in a corruption case in Mozambique. Ethiopia's electricity company says it has reconnected the Tigray region's capital to the national grid for the first time in more than a year. And security forces are hunting gunmen who killed six people, including four police officers in northwestern Nigeria. We we'll have these stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. The Democratic Republic of Congo rebel group M23 says it will withdraw from territory it seized in the past year of fighting the Congolese army and respect a recently declared ceasefire. Mohamed Yusuf reports from VOA's African News Center in Nairobi, Kenya. The M23 rebel group says it is withdrawing from positions in North Kivu province, the epicenter of the fighting that continually troubles the eastern DRC. An M23 spokesman, Lawrence Kanyuka, says the areas under its control are constantly attacked by militia groups and government forces. He says East Africa regional forces need to follow up on their proposal to give peace a chance. We can withdraw, but we want to have a meeting. We have invited the, the force, East African force, and the joint verifications mechanism to come to have a meeting with us in a way to see the modality and the implementation of the said withdrawal. At the same time, I told you as well, we have requested a meeting with the facilitation and the mediators. And the same time as well, in that dialogue with the DRC government. Fighting has raged in North and South Kivu despite recent ceasefire declarations signed in Angola and Kenya. There was no immediate government reaction to the M23 statement. The rebel group has not been invited to recurring peace talks in Nairobi and authorities in Kinshasa have been reluctant to engage with the rebel group since a previous ceasefire agreement in 2013 failed. The East African Community Regional Bloc has thousands of troops deployed in eastern DRC attempting to call the conflict there and disarm scores of armed groups. The force commanders say they were targeting more than 130 armed groups in the region. Kenyuka says people have been fleeing to M23 controlled areas to seek refuge from government forces. What is happening? We are under attack constantly, as I told you. And we have families that are running away from these attacks that need support because they are living in entities that belong to us in the moment. And we want them to actually be looked after, like those who run away as well in the other side of the government uh, control areas. So this is a human people. These are actually lives that need to be saved. So the most important things in the present time is to cater for them and to get some some support for them and family. The conflict in eastern Congo between the Congolese forces and the M23 has an ethnic component. The rebel group says it is protecting Tutsi minority tribes that are killed and displaced in the region. With elections just a year away, some experts say President Felix Shisekedi is trading carefully about how he deals with armed groups for fear of losing voters. Mohamed Yesu for VA News, Nairobi. In Mozambique, two former spy bosses and the son of an ex-president have been sentenced in a corruption scandal that triggered a national financial crisis. The son of ex-president Armando Guibuza, Nambi Guibuza, was among 19 defendants accused in the country's biggest graft case. The French news agency AFP says eight were acquitted while the rest were sentenced to terms ranging from 10 and 12 years. The two spy chiefs were found guilty of embezzlement and abuse of power, while Guibuza was convicted for embezzlement, money laundering and criminal association. 
The case focused on a scam eight years ago to borrow $2 billion from international banks to buy a tuna fishing fleet and surveillance vessels. When the loans, which were hidden from the public and parliament, were discovered, the IMF and other donors cut off financial support, triggering economic collapse for Mozambique. The judge said the crimes brought consequences whose effects will last for generations. Ethiopia's electricity company says it has reconnected the Tigray region's capital, Magale, to the national grid for the first time in more than a year. But the head uh, doctor at the city's main hospital tells VOA they still do not have power. Fred Harter reports from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Ethiopian electric power spokesman Morgus Makonin told VOA's Tigrinya service that Makele would be reconnected to the grid on Tuesday night. McConan said work was underway to repair damaged power lines in eight other areas of the Tigray region. The director of Mikele's flagship idol hospital, Kibrom Gebre Selassie, told VOA Wednesday that power has resumed in Mikele. Residents who spoke to the BBC also confirms that they were enjoying, quote, full resumption of electricity, end quote. Ethiopian state media reported Tuesday that power had been restored to Mikele. It was not possible for VOA to immediately verify the claims, as Ethiopia's government does not allow journalists into Tigray. Mikele's power supply has been erratic since federal forces were forced to withdraw in June 2021. While most of Tigray has been without phone, internet and banking services, since war broke out between the federal government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, more than two years ago. Aid workers say the lack of services has worsened the humanitarian crisis in Tigray, where 90% of the 6 million population need aid. The two sides signed the landmark ceasefire in early November that commits the federal government to unhindered aid access to the embattled region and restoring its services. However, since the deal was signed, power, internet and phone lines are still down in most parts of the Tigray region. And while food and medical aid has started trickling into the region, it has been limited. The World Health Organization said Friday it still does not have unfettered access to deliver medical supplies to Tigray. For its part, Tigrayan forces were expected to disband their fighters within 30 days of the November 2 ceasefire. Tigray's top military commander last week says his forces have withdrawn from 65% of frontline areas, but would remain in areas where foreign forces are still present. Tigray's leaders accuse Eritrean troops of continuing to commit atrocities in the region, including rapes and executions. Eritrea denies any wrongdoing and did not take part in the November peace deal. Fred Harter, for VOA News, Alice Ababa, Ethiopia. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Senior military figures and civilian groups in Sudan agreed Monday on an accord laying the groundwork for re-establishing a civilian authority. Cameron Hudson is an analyst and consultant on African peace, security and governance issues at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. He was previously a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Africa Center, where his research focused on democratic transitions and conflict in the Horn of Africa. He tells me the accord is just a tactical move by the generals and not a strategic shift in which the military will usher in an era of democracy. Well, I think it's a uh, preliminary step. Uh, There are a lot of important commitments on the page, but the problem in Sudan has never been reaching an agreement. It's always been implementing that agreement. And so oftentimes I think the military says what it knows the public wants to hear and then uh, spends most of its time looking for ways uh, to get out of those commitments. And I think that uh, we have to be aware of that history and be prepared to continue to work very hard to make sure that this agreement is implemented. In implementing this agreement, uh, the move was welcomed by the United Nations, Washington, London, Brussels, Riyadh, and Abu Dhabi, among others. So with all these spectators on hand, do you think the uh, military will renege on whatever they agreed upon? Yes, I believe that the military is going to renege on what it's agreed upon. 
because there are no consequences uh, for them if they if they do. The international community has welcomed this, but frankly, this was a, some great embarrassment to the international community. Washington and its allies were deeply embarrassed by the coup d'etat, which they tried to prevent and which happened anyway. Um, and they've spent over a year trying to restore civilian rule, and they have failed at doing so. Um, and they have done that because there haven't been any consequences uh, for the military. Anytime the military in the history of Sudan has made a concession, it's because its back was against the wall and it had no other choice. The military's back is not against the wall. It has plenty of other choices. It has withstood international and domestic pressure for more than a year. Um, so I don't believe that the military is really in a difficult position right now. Yes, it has bought itself time and space but this is, I think, a tactical move uh, on the part of the military and not some kind of strategic shift where, uh, where we're going to see the military you know, usher in an, an era of uh, democracy. I just don't believe that's going to happen. Okay, let's say the, the military goes on with the deal, but analysts are, are casting doubt over whether the aims of the agreement are achievable, given its lack of you know, detail on key issues and also the boycott yeah. of key players. Absolutely. I mean, I think we we can we can criticize this agreement uh, in the way in which it was achieved through very opaque negotiations that did not include a broad cross section of uh, society. It did not include the people on the front lines of the protest movement. It was written in a way that is you know very difficult to to understand and gives the military plenty of ways to maneuver. So I think we have uh, we have to be highly skeptical of this agreement. At the same time, I think we also have to recognize that Sudan has been stuck for the last 14 months. There has been absolutely no uh, movement or progress politically or financially. The situation for average Sudanese continues to get worse. And so Sudan was stuck in a moment that it could not escape from. And so I think the, the most charitable way we can look at this agreement right now is that it might create some new momentum for for a new reality for the country. I don't think that we're going to see implementation of either the letter or the spirit of this agreement, but it could create new opportunities uh, for new momentum. That was Cameron Hudson, an analyst and consultant on African peace, security, and governance issues at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, speaking with me by phone in Washington, D.C. Next week, dozens of leaders from African nations will be in Washington for the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. A few days ago, my colleague Vincent McCauley sat down with Dana Banks, special assistant to the president and chair of the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. This is the final of the three-part series on the goals of the summit and the major issues facing the U.S. relationships with African governments. And uh, they start by talking about President Joe Biden's Africa strategy and how it differs from previous administrations. I think um, each administration, there was also a strategy um, that was developed in in the previous administration, um, sort of a breakout from the uh, national overall national security strategy. And so most pr- um, recent administ- U.S. administrations have developed their own uh, strategy or a standalone strategy um, towards Africa because, again, the importance of the continent, not just to any one administration, but to the United States. Um, so uh, I think maybe one word to describe it is um, just an elevation and a realization of where we are now in 2022 and the challenges we face and the even more critical role that the continent will play in shaping how we deal with these challenges. Hmm. Now, uh, you cannot talk about this without uh, not, uh, without mentioning China to some degree. Many people remember that China also does invite African leaders uh, to Beijing. Now, some know and experts say China, of course, is doing its best. Hmm to become the preeminent uh, global uh, power, uh, and it's enlisting African countries to kind of enable it to get this structure. The question is, how is the United States countering this? This summit is not a counter to China. This summit is about our relationship Mm -hmm. with the continent. Obviously, there are 
uh, challenges that I mentioned where, um, where global events do come into play, such as Russia's uh, aggression towards Ukraine and the impact that that has caused on uh, wheat exports getting to the continent. Um, so what we are going to discuss is how those, uh, those types of events have a direct impact on our African partners and, again, where they would like for us to help meet them to perhaps, mm-hmm. you know, increase agricultural yeah. production across uh, the continent so that there is not as great a reliance on uh, imports from other countries and they're not as yeah. vulnerable to that. But, but quickly, you know, some say uh, China's uh, kind of uh, institutionalized its uh, mm-hmm. uh, policy towards Africa in their system and uh, because they have kind of a long-term um, kind of a strategy. The United States seems to, things change every few years because of elections, a democratic system. How does that challenge the engagement of the U.S. with Africa in a consistent way? Well, our administrations change, administrations on the continent change, but what doesn't change um, are the very real realities that we are facing globally. Uh, As we sit here and it's December 1st and we commemorate World AIDS Day, the partnership that was forged under uh, the Bush administration uh, and the the program that was rolled out that we all know today as PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, uh, that we are uh, marking its uh, 20th anniversary, and the lives that were saved across the continent, really our relationship um, with the continent goes back those 20 mm-hmm. years and even far greater with cultural exchanges, with the Fulbright program, mm-hmm. uh, with the Peace Corps program. Do you know how many uh, members of government and business that I've met on the continent said, you know, I was taught by a Peace Corps volunteer um, in my mm-hmm. community. So our relationship, the United States relationship with the continent endures. Uh, this summit is not an effort to compete. It's an effort to meet the moment with Um, our African partners to map out a strategy for how uh, to address those in the future and also how to, again, you know, realize and harness the opportunities. That was Dana Banks, the U.S. chair for the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. She was speaking with Africa 54 Managing Editor Vincent McCory. For more on the summit, please take a look at voaafrica.com and stay tuned to all your favorite VOA programs for coverage. In South Africa, the saga of robbers grabbing at least $580,000 from President Cyril Ramaphosa's ranch in 2020 has taken another twist. A Sudanese businessman, Hazim Mustafa, says he paid the money for 20 of the president's rare buffalo. The transaction and what happened thereafter threatens to collapse Ramaphosa's presidency and he faces possible impeachment. This after an independent panel found that Ramaphosa, elected in 2018 after promising to end corruption, possibly covered up the robbery to evade taxes and launder the money. Ramaphosa disputes the findings. Darren Taylor reports. Mustafa says he jetted into Johannesburg from Dubai on vacation with his South African wife in December 2019, carrying almost $600,000 in cash. He claims that he declared it, and we're still working on getting these documents from him. He also just kept asserting that he felt like this wasn't a lot of money at all, and he just didn't understand what the big deal was. Sky News Africa correspondent Yusra El Bagir interviewed Mustafa shortly before he went to ground, saying he wanted no part of any political games in South Africa. When pressing him on sort of the declaration proceedings and the paperwork, he was very clear that he didn't feel comfortable sharing that and alluded to the parliamentary process as the reason why. On a whim, apparently, Mustafa decided to buy 20 rare buffalo for his ranch in Sudan. It was his birthday, they were celebrating Christmas. He, you know, came across the farm. He had no idea at the time that it was the president's farm. He didn't know who the buffalo belonged to. He just made the purchase with a broker from the farm. Mustafa's version corroborates Ramaphosa's explanation of how the cash came to be on his ranch before it was apparently stolen from its hiding place in a sofa a few weeks later. But key questions, the answers to which could yet end Ramaphosa's presidency, remain. Did he violate the constitution by conducting private business while occupying the highest office of the land? Did he pay tax on the income? Why didn't he report the theft to the police? 
Did he send personal bodyguards to neighboring Namibia to capture and abduct the robbers and illegally extradite them to South Africa, assault them and then bribe them to maintain their silence? Ramaphosa also didn't resolve the panel's question about why, almost three years after being sold, the buffalo remain on the president's ranch. Mustafa provided El Bagir with an answer. He was like, I'm just a businessman who's, who has been waiting for my animals to be prepared for export because of COVID-19, there was delay after delay after delay. And he said very clearly that there is an understanding that he will be refunded. Mustafa's account also provides insight into who South Africa's leader is willing to do business with. I mean, this is a man who came to the forefront of the Sudanese public space over the last two years as the head of one of the main football teams. But his business dealings before then are very clandestine. He was actually investigated last year by the Ethics Committee of the Football Association for his business dealings. So he's not someone known to be transparent. Members of Sudanese business organizations told VOA that Mustafa rose from owning a small printing business in Khartoum to amassing a fortune during the rule of ousted autocrat Omar al-Bashir. They added Mustafa's main business partners currently under investigation for alleged corporate espionage. In South Africa, analysts are speculating Ramaphosa tried to keep the robbery secret in an attempt to prevent being damaged politically by being linked to a businessman of dubious repute. If that's indeed the case, they say, it has backfired spectacularly. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. Police in northwestern Nigeria have launched a manhunt for gunmen who killed six people, including four police officers at the market near the border with Niger. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. A spokesman for the Sokoto State Police Command, Sanusi Abubakar, said armed men on motorcycles opened fire Tuesday on a police patrol team outside a market in Yarl Bulut village. The attack killed four police officers and two traders. Abubakar told VOA Wednesday that police were headed to the scene to investigate. As I speak to you now, we are on transit. We are, we are going for on the spot assessment regarding the incident. Abubakar told AFP the attack could be in reprisal for the killing last week of bandits by police forces in a nearby district as the bandits tried to attack residents. Nigeria has witnessed a string of shootings perpetrated by ransom-seeking gangs whom authorities have been struggling to contain in the country's northwest. On Tuesday, medical aid group Doctors Without Borders, MSF, warned that escalating violence in the region was disrupting access to farming and worsening a malnutrition crisis there. Timothy Yobezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria.